I'm sorry. Did I just say something? Or did I just do something? Or both? And what are the implications of this question? Does it matter whether I've just said sorry to you, one person across a dinner table, or whether I've said sorry to you as members of a nation across a TV screen as your Prime Minister? We've heard some fantastic talks about the relationship between culture and politics and the way that culture can shape as well as reflect politics. My research thinks about how this works in the phenomenon of public apology and particularly the relationship between literary representations of public apology and their real counterparts or their lack of counterpart in some Australian contexts. So, what is public apology? In the last uh, few decades, the phenomenon has become incredibly visible and important. We've seen examples in uh, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Australian government's apology, and so forth. Now, this is a particularly important topic in the Australian context, um, from an earlier unwillingness to apologise, to the groundbreaking Rudd apology, to the incomplete aftermaths of these apologies that we're still currently processing. Now, literary representations of public apology represent a bit of a conundrum for critics. Do they simply reflect the culture as it is, or perhaps do they help to um, shape it? To start addressing these questions, we need to get clear on what kind of act an apology is. The apology is one of the forms of communication identified by the linguist J.L. Austin as what's called a performative gesture or speech act. He gives examples like, I promise. To say I promise is to perform the act of promising. And similarly, the act of apology is performed through the articulation of the phrase, I apologise. Now, what's important for me as a literary scholar is that in setting out his definition of performative speech and speech acts, Austin explicitly excludes performatives in literature. He argues that if a phrase like I apologise, I promise, I bequeath happens on stage, it doesn't count. And of course, the audience understands that an actor's promise is an artistic representation rather than a genuine act with genuine consequences. Now, I'm studying this, this phenomenon in relation to two particular authors, um, one of whom is the English poet Geoffrey Hill, who takes on himself the burden of apologising for others in public for things that he hasn't actually done himself. So there are all sorts of ethical issues around this. Similarly, I also work on Adrian Rich, an American poet, who's very interested in what it means for her as a white Western woman in America making amends for the sins of her country. Um, and so there's, there's a similar dimension of sort of vicariousness there. So why am I thinking about poetry and not drama or life writing or novels? So if we think about it, in scenes of public apology, and if we think back to Rudd, for instance, there's often a gap between the person making the apology and the person who committed the wrong in the first place. That's the difference between sorry for and sorry that. Now, there's this mismatch is reflected in the history of poetry. So often, like a politician speaking on behalf of a national community, the poetic I in a poem from, for hundreds of years has been figured as speaking on behalf of others. So my research into this has three aims. Um, it can, hopes to, I hope to contribute on, to research on public apology itself, and I hope to crit critique simplistic claims about literature's relationship to performative language, and I hope to um, contribute to archival and critical work on both these poets. Now, I'm working on Hill and Rich, but I'm also doing a side project on Judith Wright, and I'm talking about her today because of this Australian context. Now, she's especially important because she is one of the writers who offered her own apology before the official one was forthcoming. She actually wrote this in one of her books. To all the people of the old and true Australia on whose land I have trespassed and whom, being part of my own people, I have wronged, I plead 
forgiveness. So what happens when um, somebody says this in a book, but before anything like that has been done in law? Does it help to give the politicians a nudge? These are the kinds of questions that, that I'm trying to engage. Now, Wright's thinking around apology is especially important because she's able to acknowledge the limits of apology. She says at the end of her, of her apology, sorry above all that I can make nothing right. And that's a really important phrase. Um, thanks. As she says in one of her key poems for this, uh, this is a, a poem called Two Dream Times, which is very much about wanting to make amends and knowing those words to be, um, as philosophers say, necessary but not sufficient. So something that needs to happen, but something that's not enough in itself. She says, trust none, not even poets. So she's aware of the limits of what she's doing. Um, and so she's a particularly complex figure for thinking about this problem. So I now want to bring my own research together with the final question of how we can have a politics that reflects our best rather than our worst selves. So what my research shows in part is that so many of our political deeds are, of course, made up of words. The line between act and speech is often very thin. And if we bear this in mind, when we think about the kind of politics we want, we'll pay more attention to the language used in the political chamber, as well as the language that's eventually enshrined in legislation. The debate of the past few years, particularly around civility, for instance, in political speech, might look like a relatively superficial discussion of manners, but it points to a much larger question of respect. So to have our politics reflect our best rather than our worst instincts, we need first to watch our words. Thank you.